Sergeant Polite, will you start the cloud recording? Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Polite, will you give us the opening, please? Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the remote hearing on hospitals. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Rivera, we are ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals, and I want to start by thanking everyone present today. Many, many thanks to everyone who made this uh, committee possible. Just checking. I know we'll be joined by some of my colleagues later on, but for the sake of time and to honor everyone's schedule, I would like to start right away. Good morning. I'm Councilwoman Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals at the New York City Council. I wanna thank the representatives from Health and Hospitals and members of the public who are here this morning. And I wanna thank our committee staff for supporting the work of this hearing. At today's preliminary budget hearing, we will examine the fiscal 2022 preliminary plan, the fiscal 2022 to 2025 preliminary capital budget, fiscal 2021 to 2025 preliminary capital commitment plan and fiscal 2022 to 2031 preliminary 10-year capital strategy and the fiscal 2021 preliminary mayor's management report for New York City Health and Hospitals. As we gather here today nearly 13 months since the first reported case of COVID-19 in New York City we cannot help but reflect on the toll that the pandemic has exact, exacted on our city and on our country and worldwide over the course of a year truly like no other. To date, COVID-19 has claimed the lives of over 30,000 people, our loved ones, our neighbors, our coworkers, all in the city. COVID-19 has disproportionately killed, hospitalized and infected black and brown New Yorkers and our city continues to grapple with stark racial disparities in COVID-19 vaccinations, an unconscionable outcome that concerns this committee, my colleagues across the council and our community and health advocates. And throughout this past year, the efforts of New York City Health and Hospitals have been at the center of the city's response, providing life-saving care, testing, treatment, and vaccinations to thousands of New Yorkers, whether it was at Elmhurst, Woodhall, Jacoby, Bellevue or beyond. As my colleagues and I hold this hearing, we need to think about how COVID-19 has changed how we plan for and invest in our public health infrastructure, particularly our public hospital system. When I chaired my first budget hearing four years ago, h, h was setting out on a new plan to financially stabilize the largest public hospital system in the United States while avoiding layoffs and improving care. Those efforts under Dr. Mitch Katz saw h, h shrink its budget gap, make key investments and expand its patient pool. The overall condition of health and hospitals operating budget today entails revenues of 8.8 .8 billion and expenses of 9.1 billion. Inclusive of revenue generating and expense reducing strategic initiatives for a loss of nearly 295 million in fiscal year 2022. While I certainly look to hear updates on the efforts Dr. Katz laid out in 2018, I think it is just as important to examine how COVID is changing that plan and the mission of h, h going forward. For example, federal support totaling 507.4 million in CDC Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity, ELC, funding supported the creation of the Test and Trace Corps, a critical tenant of the city's COVID response. And as we look towards a post-COVID world, h, h has invested approximately 86.7 million in capital funding across the five-year preliminary capital commitment plan for three COVID-19 centers of excellence to treat long-haul COVID symptoms. 
At the same time, the impact of the pandemic on patient utilization led to an associated loss of $125 million to Medicaid revenues in fiscal 2021. What is clear is that in times of both normalcy as well as crisis, h and is not just a safety net for the city, but can be and often is a leader in our response to the city's most pressing health challenges. I believe that h and must recommit itself to ensuring any transformation prioritizes the preservation of ambulatory and inpatient beds and services instead of the revenue generation that more and more voluntary healthcare systems are pursuing as they downsize their hospitals, expand outpatient care and treatment, and leave communities without access to the services that they need. In order for this committee to advocate effectively for that kind of forward thinking and innovative public hospitals system, particularly one navigating the financial and patient care access and quality implications of the COVID-19 pandemic, we must put an end to the disappointing lack of publicly reviewable financial data that h, &H provides to this council and advocates. I call on the city and health and hospitals as I have in the years past to exercise greater public transparency with respect to its budget, including but not limited to the system's headcount, the test and trace core, correctional health services, and most importantly, the uses of city dollars provided to close the H and H budget gap each year. We know to better, we know that this allows us to better understand the hospital system's operational needs and ultimately to better serve the core communities, especially Medicaid and uninsured patients to which health and hospitals has historically devoted itself. Finally, let me now just discuss a matter of critical public health and moral import. We stand here today to unequivocally condemn racially motivated violence directed towards Asian American individuals and communities across the United States. And yes, right here in New York City. Hate has no place in our city. As members of the Council's Committee on Hospitals, we are ready to coordinate with our partners at Health and Hospitals, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, City Hall, and among our community-based organizations in vigorously responding to the wave of violent hate crimes against Asian Americans. Thank you, and I would like to acknowledge any of my colleagues on the Hospitals Committee who are here today. And I will actually allow, um, I will turn it over to our committee counsel and moderator of today's hearing, Harbani Ahuja, to administer the oaths and make those acknowledgements. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Um, I'd like to recognize that council members Rosenthal, Ayala, and Moya are present. Um, my name is Herbani Ahuja, and I'm counsel to the Committee on Hospitals for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use a Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hands. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Dr. Mitchell Katz, President and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. John Elberg, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of New York City Health and Hospitals. Dr. Patsy Yang, Senior Vice President, Correctional Health Services, New York City Health and Hospitals. Dr. Ross McDonald, Chief Medical Officer, Senior Assistant Vice President, New York City Health and Hospitals and CHS. And Christine Flaherty, Senior Vice President, Office of Facilities Development for New York City Health and Hospitals. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Dr. Katz, John Ulberg, Patsy Yang, Dr. Dr. Yang, Dr. McDonald, Christine Flaherty, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Katz? I do. Thank you. John Alberg? Yes, I do. Thank you. Dr. Yang? Yes, I do. Thank you. Dr. McDonald? Yes, I do. Thank you. And Dr. Um, excuse me, Christine Flaherty? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Katz, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rivera and members of the Committee on Hospitals. I'm Dr. Mitch Katz, proud president and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals. I want to acknowledge uh, the tremendous help of the chair during the time that I've been here. And uh, it was really heartwarming to hear her talk about her first committee meeting because was, that was my first committee meeting. And here comes a bicycle riding primary care doctor from California back to his hometown um, with what many people thought was a completely crazy idea that we, instead of shrinking health and hospitals uh, in order to close the deficit, we could start effectively charging uh, insurance companies for the care that we were always providing. We could uh, enroll people who were always eligible for enrollment. We could uh, code our records correctly so that it represented the true seriousness of our patients' illnesses. We could fight and sometimes even sue insurance companies to get fair rates. And that if we did all of those things and made some administrative cuts, uh, we wouldn't have to cut anything. And in fact, we could hire a net 350 more nurses and create an ambulance service uh, and an updated computer system. We did all that. And frankly, those are the only reasons we were able to do so well uh, during uh, the awful, horrible COVID pandemic. I also want to mention, because the, the chair mentioned it before I launch into it, how much I appreciate uh, her statement about um, pushing down against Asian hate. My own 17-year-old daughter is Vietnamese and surprised me last week by saying, this was even before the horrible attack in Atlanta. She said to me, Dad, why do people hate Asians? It was such a horrible thing as a father to hear, right? I mean, she's grown up in California and New York, progressive places, and yet she's already internalized the idea that people hate Asians. I found that incredibly painful as a father um, and right, really shows how much work, even in incredibly progressive places, uh, we have to do. I'm happy to report on the fiscal uh, 2020. Um, as uh, the chair has explained, a year ago, COVID arrived to New York City and required all of our energy, um, but uh, we were able to meet the need and save lives thanks to my incredibly heroic staff. Uh, we closed the first half of fiscal 21 on track and we project a strong uh, closing cash balance of $550 million uh, for fiscal year 21. Uh, but we are very concerned about looming state budget cuts, which would cause significant harm to our public health system at exactly the wrong time. I look forward to partnering with this committee um, to prevent these cuts from happening and appreciate all of the uh, commitment and advocacy this committee has done uh, over the last several years. We have extraordinary accomplishments in terms of, of healing uh, COVID, our 11 emergency departments managed 108,000 um, COVID patient visits. System-wide, more than 54,000 hospitalized patients with COVID have been safely discharged. And I'll note that two hospitals that publicly always were talked about, perhaps these hospitals weren't needed as inpatient facilities, North Central Bronx and Metropolitan performed admirably throughout the pandemic. And if we did not have those two hospitals, we never would have been able to meet the capacity needs of New York City. Uh, we have prioritized testing since the early months of the first surge, initially setting up tents outside our facilities and then launching the country's most successful 
test and trace operation in collaboration with our sister uh, department, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, Gotham Health Centers, Correctional Health Services, and the Testing and Trace Corps did more than 3.8 million COVID-19 uh, tests. And I can't tell you how many letters I received from people who said, gee, I never went to a public hospital, um, but I went for testing because I heard that you were providing better services. And uh, it's something that Chair Rivera referred to in terms of making money. Many places had long lines because they wanted to do what I would consider in most cases an unnecessary visit so they could bill the insurance companies for a wellness visit while we provided testing. Uh, of course, if someone was sick, then we provided a visit, but we did it to make testing as available and easy, not to make it as much money as possible. We've been a significant part of the city's vaccination efforts. Um, and uh, to date, we've administered more than 350,000 uh, injections of the vaccine, and we intend to remain a critical part. And it's certainly necessary in order to have the vaccine be equitable, because we know that the black and brown populations, the immigrants, the uninsured, uh, people living in poverty, the homeless, um, people who with uh, a history of being incarcerated are more likely to seek services at health and hospitals. And so if we have the vaccine available, uh, they will get it. Uh, our ambulatory care teams are serving more than 26,000 patients who had uh, COVID-19. As the chair has said, we've opened up three centers of excellence uh, for patients who have long-term symptoms. Uh, we've made great progress in other areas of the system. We've increased the insurance attribution with our primary care providers, which means that we are the dominant primary care provider for that person's insurance, and therefore we earn extra dollars. We've made our referral processes better. We've expanded express care and telehealth. Uh, my chart, which has been a huge success, uh, and again, I think shows how many misconceptions people have about low-income people, because when it was first suggested, the idea was, oh, people won't be able to access their records. They won't be interested in accessing their records. And in fact, because it can be done on a smartphone, it doesn't require a laptop. We've had tremendous uptake in the use of my chart, which enables patients to see their own laboratory results. And, and as soon as those results are done to uh, be able, I get many emails from my patients uh, through the MyChart system. They request refills for me and without visits, I'm able uh, to give them uh, the uh, refills they need. We established the H&H &H, uh, Equity and Access, Access Council aimed at eliminating barriers, institutional and structural inequities, improving the health and well-being of underrepresented and marginalized communities. We continue to improve the LGBTQ affirming system uh, and New York City CARE now has more than 50,000 members, uh, regardless of their ability to pay or documentation status, we maintain the commitment to a primary care visit in two weeks and whatever uh, services uh, they need inpatient and outpatient. I know that the uh, chair and the committee are interested in hearing more about uh, correctional health services uh, and our team led by Dr. Patsy Yang was able to achieve several important milestones in patient care. In the last year, they opened four new uh, programs to accelerate clinical effectiveness. We call them PACE units, which better serve patients with serious um, mental illness, uh, which they're really, the focus is on clinical uh, work, not on incarceration. Uh, they've launched an enhanced pre-arraignment screening uh, service program on Staten Island to screen individuals admitted to jail for medical and behavioral issues, expanding its re-entry support services to all patients starting at intake, expanded the services of the point of re-entry and transition program, um, and they were the first correctional facility in New York State 
to provide vaccine um, to persons in custody. And I just, again, want to say as someone who's run the correctional health services in both San Francisco and Los Angeles, that long before I got here, New York City had a more progressive, more extensive correctional health system um, that was more focused on what uh, inmates needed in order to be safe in jail and safe when they left jail. And I'm very proud of the improvements um, that have occurred. Um, we closed the first half of 21 on track. We beat our budget projections by 2%. We have a positive budget variance of 115 million. Our patient care receipts are 398 million better thus far this year than the same period last year. And that's huge, right? That's $400 million better than last year. But remember last year was better than the year before. And the year before was better than the year before. We have steadily been able to get the money that health and hospitals always deserve getting. And not from our patients, but from the insurers uh, of, of our patients. Our strategic initiatives associated with revenue cycle improvements, managed care contracting improvements and value payments uh, remain on track. We've generated 311 million in revenue and have site to 576 million. Uh, finally, the staffing investments that we began implementing have continued to be consistent with our overall uh, system needs, especially more nurses. And that was clearly uh, when I arrived, one of the things that I thought was farthest off is that the number of nurses did not meet the patient needs. So as we release the January plan, we're projecting a closing cash balance of $550 million. But just to give people a sense of what that means, because $550 million sounds like an awful lot of money, that's 25 days of running health and hospitals, 25 days, right? So most private institutions uh, would maintain, you know, a, between 100 days and a year of funding. Um, we are, you know, proud to have 25 days. Um, and that is recognizing that there are a lot of external risks uh, from uh, state and federal issues. Uh, we are excited to share that the DISH FMAP glitch was fixed uh, in the American Rescue Plan by President Biden, and it will enable us to offset nearly $800 million in projected losses uh, in, in fiscal year 21 and 22, a big Shout out and grateful uh, to Senator Schumer and the entire New York delegation for addressing this major impact on health and hospitals. Um, the executive state budget includes nearly $500 million in cuts to our system over the next two years, including the elimination of the public indigent care pool and a 1% across the board cut on top of the 1.5% cut uh, implemented last year. We're advocating in Albany and with support from the mayor's office and many of our critical partners and community stakeholders to eliminate these cuts. Uh, at the same time, uh, to offset these risks, the system remains focused on implementing our strategic initiatives and plan to generate over 800 million in new revenue savings in fiscal 22, growing to nearly 1.3 billion uh, by fiscal year 25. Um, against the backdrop of all this, we've been battling COVID every day. We've paid out over $1.6 billion uh, on the COVID response and committed to spending $2 billion overall. In an effort to defray these costs, we've been aggressive in pursuing available federal revenue streams. We're among the first hospitals in the nation to submit a claim to FEMA, which enabled us to receive some advanced reimbursement. We've continued to provide documentation and work closely with FEMA to continue to receive eligible reimbursement. Additionally, we were active in receiving provider relief funds through CARES. Thus far, we've received nearly 1.2 billion, largely through the safety net and hotspot allocations, which would advocate strongly for all of our frontline and the narrow margin we manage each day. So uh, in closing, Chair, I just wanna tell you that health and hospitals is filled with some of the most amazing people you'll ever meet in your whole life. And I'm so proud 
uh, to work with them. Sadly, many of them gave their life to COVID. Um, we, we remember them, we remember their sacrifice in taking care of people, their loss of life due to their hard work. And other people who survived remain traumatized from the experience of what it was like to take care of many more patients than you had ever taken care of at one time. Uh, many more people dying around you, having to worry yourself about um, getting sick, people who lived in hotels so as not to risk infecting their family members. We, we had to arrange for washing machines so that people could wash their clothes before leaving the hospital because fear was so great that people were going to bring home infection. People lived under those conditions, um, but they did it for all the right reasons. Um, they did it with open hearts. They fulfilled their commitments as nurses and doctors and social workers and pharmacists and other care providers, environmental service people. And I'm just so proud, Chair, to be part of this organization. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Maisel, Reynoso, and Levine. Um, I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Rivera. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question answer period. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for honoring and acknowledging all of the people that did give their life um, during COVID and, and for your team and their tremendous response. And you've mentioned a, a few things, I mean, from the federal and state to local level. So before we jump into questions about COVID, of which I have many, and I'm sure my colleagues do as well, I just want to first address those proposed cuts in the state budget that you touched on, which, you know, we all know the budget needs to pass by the end of March. If, if these cuts, which I'm actively fighting against with a number of my colleagues across the city and state, were to go into effect, how would how would it affect H and H's budget and operations, and what are H and H's proposals for how the state budget should invest in our safety net hospitals? Well, thank you, Chair. I'm going to turn to our really terrific Chief Financial Officer uh, John Olberg, who used to be part of the the state government and who really understands how the the money flows, and, and ask him to address the questions. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the cuts, let's, we have to keep in mind, right, that when the, the governor proposed these cuts, this was prior to the relief that, uh, that the federal government provided um, as part of um, the CARES Act, as well as the most recent, you know, COVID relief. And I think it's, it's very well welcomed that, you know, the state budget deficit, which is about almost, you know, $13 billion, which is a deficit that I'd never seen in my nearly 20 year career at the budget division. It's a, it's a significant amount of money. Um, and I think the important thing to also remember is it's, it's multi-year, right? 13 billion is just this year's amount, but the way you know, folks that in Albany do their financial plans like everyone else is that there's many years to that. But the, the relief bill was about enough to cover the first year amount of uh, the deficit. And when those cuts um, were developed, you know, by the budget division was prior to having an understanding of that relief amount. Um, I will also say we, we, we spent a lot of time, you know, tracking very carefully uh, the budget process. Um, we have meetings with uh, uh, the legislature, both fiscal committees this week. Uh, it's our understanding that, you know, both one house bills pretty much negate those cuts. Um, but nonetheless, you know, there's very likely going to be some sorts of reductions we need to advocate uh, against those cuts, um, you know, the $500 million number is very significant. You know, it's, it's a two-year estimate. Um, when you take that into the context that our closing balance for the year is about uh, in that same uh, range, it, that, that would speak uh, in terms of how uh, devastating those cuts could be on health and hospitals. But we, we remain, we try to be good partners with the state. We try to find creative solutions. Um, we try, you know, we, we try to find uh, improvements to the care system that will result in savings. So we, we try to be a good partner, uh, you know, with the Medicaid program and, uh, and the state. I understand. And I know that you have to be creative, and innovative, but that it's, 
like unprecedented creativity with with that amount. So um, I thank you for for trying your best. And I know from the onset of the pandemic, H and H has acted not just as a safety net for the city, but as a leader in our response. And I just want to thank everyone here on this call for that. I know you've rolled out several new initiatives, which I mentioned, which to identify and treat COVID-19. Uh, these include the test and trace core, what we call T2, uh, the COVID centers of excellence, and then of course the vaccine distribution program. So with the vaccine rollout underway and President Biden predicting that enough supply will be available to inoculate everyone in the country by the summer. What is your expectation for these programs in fiscal year 2022 and beyond? And will any of these programs or elements of them be incorporated into h, &H standard operations moving forward? Well, thank you, Chair. Certainly uh, the COVID centers of excellence um, will continue because we believe that there will be people who will have very long-term uh, sequelae, long-term symptoms from COVID and that those centers will be necessary. We also want to address when you think, well, why, you know, why did so many people get sick uh, from COVID? Uh, much of the illness is due to primary care diseases like hypertension and diabetes. Um, and if we did a much better job of reaching people, bringing them in, treating their hypertension, their heart disease, their diabetes, uh, then uh, they would be less susceptible in the future um, to illnesses like COVID. Uh, whether COVID, I think most experts, although you know COVID continues to surprise and make us all humble, um, but I think most people believe that that the what we call COVID will not ever go completely away, uh, but that we will be vaccinated um, as a population and therefore we will not have the horrible hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, but we're going to need to maintain a structure for um, being able to test people um, and isolate them. Uh, we, we haven't talked, one of, one of our big programs is we are currently running uh, four hotels full of people who we are enabling them to isolate from their families. And we do whatever it takes so that they can safely do that. We walk their dogs, we bring them prescriptions, we bring them uh, methadone, we, we take care of their children, we do whatever is necessary so they can isolate. I think there'll be an ongoing need um, for that uh, going forward. Um, so there's still going to be a lot of need. It's quite possible that vaccinations will require boosters um, or will require reformulations as the virus evolves. So it could be like the flu. We need to get everybody uh, vaccinated uh, every year. Um, so we're going to keep our infrastructure in place um, and we're going to continue to meet whatever you know, New York City needs. Well, speaking of infrastructure, I wanted to ask about the test and trace core, or what we call T2. And it partnered with a number of community-based organizations to run pop-up testing sites and do education and outreach around testing. So you expanded 39 of the original 41 contracts to June of this year for a total of 15.8 million. Is part of this expansion to do outreach and education around vaccinations? And is there a plan to include CBOs with cultural competence in the vaccination program? Well, absolutely, Chair. As you state, I mean, that if for people to get the correct uh, message, um, we need to have culturally competent providers. And in fact, I, I'm a big uh, opposer of the use of even the term uh, vaccine hesitancy because it puts the burden on the person and it says that it's obvious that they should get vaccinated and they're hesitant to do it, right? When really the burden is on us to explain to people in, in their own language um, with their own metaphors as to why getting vaccination is a positive thing. 
Uh, the program that you referred to is, is in collaboration with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and we will continue to work closely with them. We see huge value in uh, the community-based organizations doing pop-up testing um, because of the cultural competency and joining us in the vaccine efforts as well. Well, I highlight this in particular because I sent uh, you and DOHMH a letter about a month ago calling for a census style public outreach effort around vaccine skepticism, but I haven't received the response. And we already see that vaccine rates are not equitable amongst communities of color. And as more people become vaccinated, the challenge really is going to be reaching these harder to convince communities for a number of issues. So what are we doing to address this issue with T2? Can the administration provide this committee with a copy of the most up-to-date iteration of the Memorandum of Understanding, the MOU governing the T2 program? Yeah, I will, I will do that right after this hearing, Chip. Okay, great. And if you could respond, I mean, the, 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 the census style public outreach piece you know, we encountered the same issue, clearly not exactly the same. The reason I make the comparison is because in order to get communities who, you know, have a history of, of being mistreated and abused uh, by this government, by quote unquote public service, to reach those, those, those hard to reach communities for the census to get them to respond, um, we really had a community-based effort and it was led by CBOs and so, you know, that's why I wrote the letter to you. That's why I'm hoping to receive a response. And I do think that, you know, we're getting closer and closer to this deadline, to this date that's been set by the federal government. And it's, it's just incredibly important that we honor the work that a lot of these organizations have already done. We, we rely on them for so much. And then when it comes to something this important, you know, we do have to support them financially. Understood. So, yeah. So the COVID testing, and vaccination efforts at H&H &H have clearly shown how issues in language access and cultural humility have created further inequities in access to these life-saving initiatives. This is part of a larger trend of insufficient investment in language access across all hospital systems. Will H&H &H be increasing the budget for language access in light of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, well, we, we have no limit on it. Uh... So we, we have a variety of contractors uh, and we will provide translation every time somebody needs translation. And I, I have heard there have been occasional times when the, due to the speed at which the program was launched that some of the people doing it didn't realize that they always had access. So we, we, because we have extensive um, contracts are ready to do interpretation. No one in health and hospitals or teachers should ever feel that they cannot get at that moment appropriate translation. And that makes me sad that it's happened. I, I, do, I do know of two times when it happened and we addressed it immediately as an education effort to explain to people why, you know, how they get uh, the appropriate translation, but we don't we don't limit the budget and I will not ever set a limit and say, okay, well, I'm sorry, we can't translate for you because we spent our, we spent our translation budget. We will always provide whatever translation people need. Well, we want to be helpful. And I, I held a hearing on language access as related to our COVID-19 response, you know, a few weeks ago, and we were really underwhelmed by the city's responses. So I only say that to tell you to be very, very direct and detailed about your needs, because we asked, we asked for, you know, really nuanced information and, and failed to receive it. So, you know, I also know that T2 enabled H&H &H to reach a variety of new people, both uninsured and with private insurance. And the folks maybe showed up to an H&H &H facility for the first time ever to receive a test or a vaccine or use H&H's expanded telehealth services. So does H&H &H anticipate that this uh, telehealth service connected more people with the hospital system? And if so, what impact could this have financially in the future? And how do you aim to retain these individuals in your patient pool? Sure, well, the, we, we definitely wanna maintain um, the access via telephonic or video because we recognize that there are people who 
you know, respond better, people who would not feel comfortable. I mean, I think one of the most successful uses that we've had of this has been uh, for buprenorphine, where we work with homeless um, or uh, people living on the street um, who have addiction issues. And we can now, through a, a tablet, connect them to a provider who can prescribe buprenorphine for them. And I think that's right, shows how far you can, you know, use this technology to bring necessary care. Uh, anyone can now uh, have an emergency visit at any of our H&H &H sites, uh, telephonically or through the video, uh, through our express care. Uh, and it's something we want to continue to expand. And I do think it gives us both an opportunity to reach populations that we haven't reached before. Hospitals tend to be where they historically are, uh, right? You can't move them around. It's one of the challenges of brick and mortar, uh, but being able to provide phone or video visits makes a huge difference. As, um, and we, we wanna keep expanding that. And I hope it will bring in people who realize that getting your care at a system that is not primarily focused on making money uh, often leads to better care. I'm very proud of the fact that none of my providers have any incentive to do tests or procedures that may not be absolutely necessary because none, everybody is on a salary. And so there's no advantage to doing more unless you need more. And I think people saw that while maybe our infrastructure is not as pretty, we don't have those mauve kind of walls, we don't have the marble tables, uh, Christine Flaherty has done a great job of fixing our facilities, but we're not going to have teak wood, you know, in our waiting rooms. It's just not going to happen. It's not who we are. Uh, but that is, it's not the teak wood that makes the great nursing. It's not the teak wood that makes the caring doctor, um, right? And people mistakenly associate, you know, rich looking waiting rooms with great care. And that's just not true. Um, so, I hope that this, that the experience, all of the people, one of the ways that uh, we connect is that for people who have gone for testing uh, with us or who got vaccination, we sign up to my chart, which then gives them the ability to set an appointment, to have a video visit, um, to see their labs, to feel connected to us. And we think that's one of the ways we'll continue to bring in uh, insured patients as well. Got it. No, I know we, and of course the council and many others are, are working on expanding access just generally digitally uh, with broadband. So we hope that we can all work together on that. So the fiscal 2021 to 2025 preliminary capital commitment plan includes 86.7 million in capital funding for three COVID-19 centers of excellence to provide comprehensive outpatient services to recovering COVID-19 patients. Two COEs, these centers of excellence, one in the Bronx and another in Jackson Heights, Queens, they have opened and a third is expected to open in July. Can you elaborate on budgeted expense funding for the COEs as of the city's fiscal 2022 preliminary plan and or h, &H fiscal 2022 January financial plan? And can you clarify how h, &H provides or plans to provide outpatient care to recovering COVID-19 patients outside of the COEs and how this care to the extent applicable is integrated with services provided at h, &H existing facilities. Well, I'll start Chair, and then I'll ask uh, John Alberg to fill in the details as to whether we've separately budgeted. You know, again, a little bit like the translation, um, we will always take care of the people who come to us. Um, we don't set limits on how many people we will, you know, take care of. We never, in fact, even in the COVID, uh, not only did health and hospitals not collapse, but we took patients from three other hospitals that weren't able to manage their patient flow because that's what we do. Um, so uh, for uh, the, the centers of excellence, we've budgeted them as we would budget any of our outpatient care. We recognize that there is a uh, expense, there's a revenue. On the outpatient area, uh, nobody, uh, even with very good insurance, it's very hard to break even on 
inpatient on outpatient care. Um, but again, we do that out of mission. Uh, some people will want to go to a dedicated place. Some people will want to go where they've always gone, right? So in your in your neighborhood, Carlina uh, Chair, if uh, people have always gone to Gouverneur, they'll probably keep going to Gouverneur. If they've always gone to Bellevue, they probably will keep going to Bellevue. But we we wanted the centers of excellence created with a specific equipment like uh, pulmonary function tests and radiologic equipment that would make it easier for us to care for people uh, with these issues. Let me ask John whether there is a separate expense for them or that whether it's just baked into our ambulatory care budget. Yeah, so I think um, first on the capital side, um, you know, we made a pretty significant investment in these three facilities and Christine can help me here, but the total cost for all three is somewhere in the neighborhood of $140 million. And I would say roughly 87 to 90 million will be funded with uh, the city capital program. And the balance, uh, we have a proposal to be funded uh, via FEMA. Um, Christine did, and her team did an excellent job um, to press to get these facilities you know, uh, online sooner than we had expected. And um, you know, there's, as you had mentioned, um, council chair, two, two are operating in one, hopefully in April. The way we set their budget is we assume that eventually, right, as they establish themselves in the community, right, the, the revenue will offset the expenses, but it takes time to build that patient base. And our initial estimate across all three is that somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 million will need to be, uh, you know, budgeted within uh, health and hospitals, right, to cover uh, those facilities until they're fully operational. Thank you. And I know there are some, um, there are voluntary hospitals who are operating similar centers. I know Mount Sinai certainly does. So I'd be interested in knowing how you all are collaborating or learning from each other. But I do wanna just move on to CHS because I see a couple of my colleagues have questions and I don't want them to wait any longer than a few more minutes. So I just wanna turning to CHS and, and, and thanks to the both of you, of course. I'm very concerned to see the number of people released from Rikers who are at severe risk for COVID um, has, has flattened through 2020. And the number of people incarcerated on Rikers has increased from its 2020 low. So I know that CHA staff have spoken out about these issues. And I want you to know that I believe that DOC and City Hall must do more to decrease the population of incarcerated New Yorkers on Rikers Island. But looking at CHS's budget, what were CHS's actual expenses for COVID care and how much is budgeted for fiscal year 2022? And what are current budgeted actual expenses for personal protective equipment, PPE, for the staff at CHS? Uh, Dr. Yang is gonna answer. I mean, some of those questions we may have to get you exact figures. I don't know that we have broken out. Again, I'll say that uh, for correctional health and for the whole system, never once did I say, or did I hear anyone from City Hall say, okay, Mitch, you can have protective equipment, but only spend up to this amount. Uh, we spent whatever we needed to spend throughout the pandemic to get as much equipment as possible. And I, I will not put limits on what uh, Dr. Yang has to spend in order to provide appropriate care for uh, those people who are incarcerated. That's our mission. That's what we do. Uh, but Dr. Yang, can you speak to what figures you do have? Yes, um, I appreciate the question. Um, as, as Dr. Katz noted, we don't have that broken out. Um, basically, from last March, um, we have really dedicated and focused all of our effort and resources on COVID, um, which includes in our strategy to contain the, uh, the impact of COVID, includes maintaining access to basic, you know, the, the regular health care that people need or that our patients need in order to, to stay as healthy as they can um, and to, to be in a, in a strong position to, to ward off the more serious consequences of, of, of the disease should they have contracted the virus. 
Um, we, we did not have shortage of PPE or, or testing capability or more recently vaccine. Um, we focused really on, on testing people, created a, an entire housing uh, spectrum with the Department of Correction um, where we cohorted people who are similarly um, on the COVID spectrum together and, um, and now we're vaccinating. So it's really been all of our resources, um, particularly since uh, maintaining access to healthcare is one of the fundamental approaches that we have. I can try and get you breakdowns um, later, Chair. That would be great as, as, soon, as soon as you can, considering we are talking in numbers yeah. today. How are individuals in, incarcerated on Rikers or in other city jail facilities being evaluated for eligibility and vaccinated? Yes, um, thank you. Um, we, we are bound by the, the guidance from the governor. Um, and uh, back in Jan on January 6th, we were, as Dr. Katz noted earlier, the first uh, correctional facility in the state of New York to begin offering vaccine um, to our patients. We were able to do that by arguing successfully that um, some of our most vulnerable patients were clinically analogous to residents of state oversight or state operated facilities in the communities like nursing homes. Um, and as the guidance expanded by age to 65 and older, uh, 75 and older, 65 and older, 60 and older, or to persons with comorbidities, um, we applied those, those, those standards and, and eligibility guidance to, to our patients since uh, there was no explicit um, mention of, of carceral status. Um, so currently the, there's about, you know, the, the state guidance um, covers about 37%, th a third to 37%, depending on our census um, of, pa of our current patients um, who are eligible. We know the demand is out there. We've created a waiting list um, so that as eligibility continues to expand, we know who wants the vaccine and how, and we reach out to them. Um, we continue to do education with all our patients. Um, as Dr. Katz also mentioned, it isn't hesitancy so much as our continuously providing information and having dialogue with our patients so that they can weigh their own perceived risk of, of vaccination versus, versus disease. CHS has since last December been advocating actively with the state um, to allow us to offer vaccine to anybody, um, regardless of their age or health condition, basically based on the, on the nature of the carceral congregate setting, which we, we think is a risk factor in and of itself. Um, and we remain hopeful that we will, will get that approval. Great, I think many of us uh, feel like this is a congregate care setting and, and the administration should just go ahead and vaccinate those individuals. But, but I understand you know, why you're trying to do your best to, to be in the, in the collaborative spirit, though this is urgent. So we, we support you on those efforts. So I, I have other questions, but I wanna move on to my colleagues who have patiently waited. And so I'll turn it over to committee council so we can go through the list of those who have uh, raise their hand to ask a question of the administration and thank you thus far for for all your responses thank you chair i'm now going to call on council members in the order in which they have raised their hand using the zoom raise hand function as a reminder if council members would like to ask a question please use the zoom raise hand function now um, council members please keep your questions to five minutes the sergeant at arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up you should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced that you may begin. We will begin with council member Maisel, followed by council member Rosenthal, followed by council member Ayala. Council member Maisel, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Um, good morning, uh, Dr. Katz. Um, I'm happy you are here. Uh, what I'm going to say is I don't want to uh, mitigate against um, the tremendous job that Health and Hospitals has done uh, during your administration, but I do want to express some frustration I had recently uh, with HHC. Um, when I reached out to your office um, several weeks ago, um, frankly, I was stonewalled. I cannot understand why a member of this committee cannot call the head of uh, HHC to have questions answered. Um, I did not get the courtesy of a phone back a uh, phone call back by anybody from your staff to find out exactly what kind of questions I had. Uh, unfortunately, um, it was very disappointing to me. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm really quite surprised that uh, transparency apparently is not uh, something that you practice. 
it's spoken about, but you don't practice it. Thank you. Well, I just said, I'm terribly sorry, council member. Multiple people uh, on the council call me on my cell phone, text me. I'm sorry you don't have that number. I'm happy I did not know uh, you called. I would have called you back as soon as I got that message. I'm very sorry. But your staff was very, very active of you. And um, they, I guess they didn't think that my questions uh, were worthy enough for you to spend your time on. Well, I'm so, very sorry. I disagree with that assessment. You are a council member, and any question that you have is worth, more than worthy of my time. And I will send you uh, my cell phone after this uh, call, and I will, you know, welcome any time you want to call or text me. I think you'll find from your colleagues that I always respond as soon as somebody calls a text. I'm very sorry. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, and next we will hear from Council Member Rosenthal for questions. Time starts now. Okay, I believe Council Member Rosenthal might not be there. Um, we'll circle back, Council Member Ayala. Time starts now. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Um, Dr. Katz, I want to actually say thank you. I, I, I was able to get inoculated at Metropolitan this week, and I was really happy, and the staff was great, um, as always. You have wonderful staff. Um, my question, and I, I think is a, is a question that I ask repeatedly at these, at these hearings, is really regarding the number of mental health beds. Um, I'm really concerned with what, everything that happened during the pandemic and, and the repurposing of those beds that we may not, you know, yet be back to, to normal per se. Hi. Wondering how Hi. many, um, how many of the beds that were repurposed are back online? Did we lose any? Did we add any? I think at some point we were talking about there were going to be some additions, but we never really got clarity about at which hospitals, um, and that that's still a concern of mine. Uh, a concern of mine as well. Uh, we did have to repurpose beds during during the heat of COVID, and we did at one time have decreased demand for psychiatric beds uh, at the same time that. Uh, people without COVID were staying home in general. Uh, but that's changed now. And we have a lot of demand for psychiatric beds right now. I believe I'll have to get back to you on Jesus. I believe everything is back uh, with the exception of one ward uh, where there was always the intention to do reconstruction work. And the reconstruction work had started and we're trying to get it back online. Uh, but I do believe that mental health is one of our chief missions. A lot of the private hospitals have gone out of business doing um, behavioral health work because they don't see the revenue margin on it. But we do it out of mission. Um, I think there are uh, genuine workforce issues right now. Psychiatrists are very hard to recruit at any salary. There are just not as many psychiatrists, especially psychiatrists interested in inpatient work. Um, we can, we're able to recruit psychiatrists for the emergency room and psychiatrists for outpatient work. We're having a lot more difficulty recruiting psychiatrists to do inpatient wards. And we're working with the state on the question of whether or not we can change the workforce issues, uh, more heavily use uh, psychologists, um, nurse practitioners, um, other workforce people, because in some cases um, we've been, we're diminished because we can't recruit enough psychiatrists to safely run um, our wards. But I will get you an exact count. Why do you think that is? Because that, that concerns me, right? Um, I think we're going to see a surge in behavioral health, you know, cases in the next, you know, uh, few years. I think that people are still, we're, we're all still kind of sleeping through our trauma. Um, it was a very difficult year. We're still not through that year. We're still living it. And I think that, you know, we're seeing a lot of, you know, a lot more need 
for uh, mental health services. And, and, and obviously a lot of people rely on health and hospitals for that service. So that, that concerns me. Why do you think that we're having such a difficult time? I mean, I, I understand that the reimbursement rates are not, you know, uh, you know anything to brag about. And I, I, I believe that that may be a contributing factor, but I just wonder what your thoughts are on why we're having such a difficult time attracting um, psychiatrists. Well, there, there, it, there is a national shortage. So there's purely just on a nationwide basis. If you calculate how many psychiatrists are needed, there are not that many psychiatrists. There's quite a large deficit. Uh, so it's not primarily about what you pay them because it, there's a sheer shortage. So whatever you're going to pay, you're just gonna push up um, the rate. I do think that because private facilities close, then there are certain people who would work in the private sector who won't work in the public sector and you lose access to them. I think the things, I mean, I always try to be solution generating, right? Because I can't change the shortage, the national shortage of psychiatrists. So, you know, there are other solutions. We are working with the office of the state office. There are many that I would requirements that I think uh, make the job of the inpatient psychiatrist more paperwork than would be absolutely necessary. Clinicians like to see patients. They don't like to fill out endless paperwork. And as hospitalizations have gotten shorter, which is genuinely a, a good thing, um, because you shouldn't keep someone in a locked facility if they're ready to be in a non-locked facility. But what it's done is there's all this paperwork at the beginning and there's all this paperwork at the I'm end. By it. Uh, and so you feel like your whole job is paperwork. Um, so I think making it less bureaucratic would make it more attractive, but ultimately it's going to require the use of more licensed social workers, more psychologists, more psychiatric nurse practitioners, more psychiatric technicians, it's going, we're going to need to use psychiatrists for what psychiatrists can uniquely do, which is to prescribe. Um, but we're going to have to take advantage of the other professionals who are able to provide the other parts. Uh, so what I'd say is just the, the, um, the field has not progressed around workforce as rapidly as it needs to. And I think we, because we're the leading psychiatric provider in all of New York City, we need to be at the forefront uh, saying this is a model that will work. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ayala. And we're going to go back to Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Appreciate that. And with apologies, we're all multitasking here. Dr. Katz, it's good to see you. Chair Rivera, thank you so much for this awesome hearing. Um, Council Ahuja, you're amazing as always. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on something you said in your testimony, Dr. Katz, that one of the reasons you came to New York City is to increase reimbursement, that you thought it would be possible for us to to bill better and, and increase our reimbursement from Medicaid. Has someone already asked you this question? I'm just curious whether or not how you feel that's coming along. Like what have you learned about, you know, are we underbilling in this area or that area? Have you seen Medicaid reimbursement go up? I don't know, like that. Sure, so the biggest areas of, of going up are not so much uh, Medicaid reimbursement, but it's uh, effectively billing private insurance um, oh. is the biggest area uh, because health and hospitals has a long tradition of providing free care sure. to everyone, which is good. Uh, the part about, but we should still bill insurance. Yeah, got yeah. Lost. So how have you found, how's that going? Hundreds of millions of dollars um, have come in because of that over, if you total over the cumulative, it's over a billion dollars uh, that we've brought in. And the, the, the parts of it, the part that has to do with Medicaid is not the rate. The part with Medicaid was that people were eligible, but no one was enrolling them. Got it. Uh, if we, yeah, I apologize. Go ahead. 
Right, right. I'm so sorry. I'm on the clock and you're being so wonderful. Have you sent over to the finance team that information? So so if, if you can, could you send over sort of the, uh, I think you guys go on the fiscal year, you know, what the number was when you first got here next year and the year and the year after for private insurance? Happy. So see sort of the rate of growth or or whatever, and then for Medicaid, uh, whatever it is that you did. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I forgot my second question and all the excitement. I remember. So, and perhaps Councilmember Rivera already touched on this again. Um, uh, in terms of tracking the additional costs during COVID. I assume you've tracked all that and that is all reimbursable via FEMA at 100%. I'm wondering two things. One, if you've done that and started submitting your paperwork for that. And two, what's the delta from going from 75% to 100% now? Uh, so yes, we've already put in our paperwork and we project that before we're done, we'll spend uh, $2 billion. So the 75 to 100% would be a quarter of $2 billion, which is $500 million. So you'll get reimbursement for 2.5 million? Yeah, yeah. no, we'll get reimbursement for 2 billion, but which is 500 million more than we would have when it was 75. Got it, got it, got it. And so, can you break that down? Is that all for FY20? Uh, no, uh, it, it would it would be for two fiscal years in a row because we started in March with expenses and we're certainly going to have expenses at least through the next year. Right, so right. And how years. much, but you've submitted for 200 uh, million and perhaps it would be more that you can submit. Right, we will keep submitting it as we, you have to put it in form that FEMA understands. So sure. your goal is to send it all in. Yeah, so darn that bureaucracy. Um, so just to confirm, for fiscal year 21, what was the dollar value? And what do you expect the dollar value to be for fiscal year 22? Okay, uh, I would need John to answer the Ulberg, the two, those two numbers. Right, yeah. and what I'm getting at, and again, I only have 28 seconds is, so you have an amount for FY21, an amount for FY22, which is gonna include an estimate for the rest of the fiscal year, and then what your estimated number is for FY23. Correct, yeah. correct. And we can break all those numbers out for you and send them over. Um, you know, they're all excellent questions. Dr. Katz is right. We keep track of this based on the total estimate. Time which is expired. Great. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll hear back from the finance team about that. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, Councilmember Rivera. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. I'm going to turn it back to Chair Rivera. And as a reminder for all other council members, if you have questions, you can use the Zoom raise hand function. Chair Rivera. Sure, and thank you. Of course, thanks to all my colleagues for being here. And of course, uh, Chair Rosenthal, who is the chair of the subcommittee on capital. So a couple of things, uh, just a few questions. And I know we have people who, who want to testify. You mentioned earlier that the federal stimulus should result in fewer expected cuts in the state budget. Can you elaborate about which program cuts you expect to change and by how much those cuts are currently expected to shrink? John, can you take this? Yeah, I would say the, the cut that we find most disturbing um, is the cut to the indigent care dish pool. Um, and that's a cut that's really targeted at all public hospitals. Um, and uh, we, we have advocated uh, vociferously about uh, you know, having that restored. Um, that's roughly about $250 million, you know, over the two years. Um, so that would be the one that we, we and, and we basically are unique in that respect. So that is one that we would like to def have restored. The across the board cuts are just simply budget actions. Um, 
we were cut last year by one and a half percent. You know, the, the entire Medicaid program is an across the board cut this year. Uh, the governor is proposing um, a one percent cut, and I, and I think both of those you know will get restored. There's a, there's a cut to the capital program, but again, I think that the the um, stimulus dollars that were uh, you know that were provided in in the COVID bill that were aimed you know specifically at the state of about twelve billion dollars, and uh, New York City also received I think about four billion dollars. We again we think that will take a lot of pressure off the need to cut. Uh, the Medicaid program. Is vaccine distribution being funded by the federal government or are any city funds being contributed to the program? Uh, we assume at this point that all uh, expenses will be billed to FEMA. That's our current assumption because it's obviously part of the emergency response. Remember that the vaccine itself we're not paying for. So there's no cost to us of the vaccine. The only costs are the administration of the vaccines. Understood. Actually, I see a, count, a, a colleague of mine who'd like to ask a question. Um, if, if that's okay with committee counsel, I'd like to recognize council member Mark Levine. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. Uh, thank you for uh, your incredible leadership of this committee and this crisis uh, for hospitals and of course your great work in this hearing the city is lucky to have you in this role and um dr katz and and the team at h and h uh i know this has come up a lot this morning i just want to add my thanks to you uh and to the people of our public hospital system for what you have done for the city over the last 12 months i don't even want to think what this crisis would have been like if we didn't have our public hospitals. Uh, I, I don't think there can be any doubt of how important you are to the health of the city, um, despite the challenges you faced in getting adequate resources. Uh, so thank you to you and 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 to the the, the many people at H and H who have worked and served and sacrificed over the year. Um, I, I I know that you mentioned NYC Care uh, in your opening statement. Uh, it was very hard to hear that the number of enrollees, I think you said is now up to 50,000, which is great news. And I, I really see that access to primary care is gonna be one of the ways that we address the horrible inequality that um, has been uh, revealed and exacerbated in this pandemic. And that NYC care is, is one way to connect um, the, the many, many people in the city who don't have the benefit of a regular primary care doctor where they go for the annual physical or their, their uh, vaccinations or um, just to get early warning if there's any kind of problem. Um, I wonder if you could just talk about what you see as the role of, of NYC care um, in, in closing the health equity gap uh, in, the, in the months uh, and years ahead for the city. Uh, well, thank you. Um, very much for that question, Council Member Levine. Uh, New York City has always provided a progressive set of benefits um, within health and hospitals, but one of the challenges is how would anybody newly arrived to the city know that? How would you, you're a new immigrant to uh, New York City, how would you know that you could go to Elmhurst Hospital or Bellevue and get state-of-the-art care without being billed uh, in a way that would bankrupt you and your family. And my, my feeling is, well, you wouldn't know that. And so you would just wait and wait and not go to care until you were already quite sick. And that uh, the job of NYC Care is to make people aware that they don't have to wait that long. Um, they can, right from the beginning, they can join us, they can get a primary care visit Having your own doctor who cares about you is in, in and of itself a healing thing. Knowing where to go when you're sick so that you don't have to go to the emergency room, I think makes everybody's care better. So we, we've heard a lot from uh, people and we've been even through the crisis. I mean, one of the, the chief uh, features of NYC care was a primary care appointment in two weeks. And we kept to, to that. They, were, they had to be by phone uh, during the worst times of the pandemic, but we never stopped enrolling people and we never stopped 
making that commitment to two weeks. Because what I didn't want this to be is just like a, a plastic card. Um, and nobody knows what the plastic card is for. And after a while, everybody gets cynical and loses the plastic card. I wanted it clear that the plastic card equals an appointment with a primary care doctor in two weeks and that within two weeks and that that then means you're connected to the system. Can you, this is, this is great to hear. Can you say anything about um, uh, increases in, in accessing care? Are people coming in more for either annual physicals or vaccinations or um, are, are you finding that you're catching early diagnosis of whether it's diabetes or other conditions uh, more frequently of those who have enrolled in NYC care? Uh, visits are definitely up. Um, I don't, I have to think about how I would measure new diagnoses. That's, I have to think about that, whether how I would know whether or not new diagnoses are up. So let, let me give that question some thought and see if there's- well, I mean, it, ultimately the, the idea would be that people who otherwise might not have sought medical care until they were in crisis and showed up in an emergency room are gonna be able to catch things earlier. And that's better first and foremost for the patient, of course. Time expired. Um, uh, and I'll wrap up, but it's also better for the medical system because it's just, it's cheaper and easier uh, to, to treat something early uh, to prevent it from uh, developing into a crisis. Um, and, and, and I'll wrap up, but, but maybe you could just close with any thoughts on, on, on whether how you, how you, and how you think that's actually gonna play out in reality that we will be able to avoid um, medical conditions escalating to crisis? Well, first I'd like to make you an honorary primary care doctor <laughs> for you know, thoughtful explanation of why primary care matters. I do think based on my own medical practice and the practice of my colleagues that when people know um, that there's a place to call, they don't go to the emergency room. Um, and they get better care because in an emergency room, the person taking care of you doesn't know you. And none of us as doctors take as good care of people we're just meeting as we do of people that we know and understand. Um, because when we know them, we know what their baseline is. Um, and we can tell, and it's, it's especially important when you're taking care of people with underlying illness. And if you're, if you're a healthy person, a doctor should be able to say you're a healthy person at every visit. But if you have a lot of underlying illness, knowing how short of breath you typically are enables a doctor to know whether or not to change your medicines for congestive heart failure. If I don't know how short of breath you are at your baseline, it's very hard for me to know how to adjust your medications. Um, and so I think that's why primary care makes such a difference. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and, and again, thank you for everything that you and the team have done. And, and uh, back to you, uh, Chair Rivera, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you for everything you've done during this crisis and, and for your thoughtful questions here today. So uh, to all of you, uh, I, I just have a few more questions. And then again, I know we have people waiting who are also listening and anticipating a lot of, a lot of uh, your responses. Um, so as I stated in my opening remarks, I certainly wanna advocate for health and hospitals work and thank all of the staff at health and hospitals who have worked so tirelessly this last year. So you've heard us thank you and we are in incredibly grateful. And we also need to be holding you accountable, which I always make sure I let people know, all of our health leaders across the city. So I remain deeply concerned with some of the, the lack of detailed financial information that Health and Hospitals provides this committee and the public. And so I, I know that Dr. Katz, you were nominated by Mayor de Blasio to serve as the CEO and president of H&H, &H, and, and we started our jobs at, at roughly the same time. Do you believe that health and hospitals deserves less public accountability than other agencies like DOHMH or DOT simply because it is a public benefit corporation? No, no, I believe in the same level of transparency. The administration explained to the council's finance division that it will not furnish a breakdown of headcount 
by funding source at health and hospitals. What's the rationale for this position? I, I didn't, I've never heard that. Uh, I mean, by funding source, I guess I can a little bit understand that, and maybe John can explain. I don't think of a nurse as having a funding source, say, that is, or myself or John or an environmental service person. I think of we have the expenses that we have and we have the revenues we have. I mean, there are some specific programs. So for example, uh, the state will fund a specific uh, action treatment for patients with psychiatric problems. So that would be an example where there would be a very detailed state provides this funding for this service. But most of our funding, I would say, is a general pot of funding. And what's my job is to make sure that uh, we have enough funding to cover my expenses. Uh, John, do you have it? Can you explain it better than I have? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, Council Chair, I, I think um, we had forwarded um, over to you um, our recap of the financial plan um, at the halfway point. And prior to COVID, we had a cadence where I thought we would, you know, sit down with your staff and just, you know, give you a briefing if you thought it was useful over on the, you know, the financial performance of, of health and hospitals. And, and maybe, you know, we could get back, you know, into having those, you know, scheduled meetings. I, I feel very strongly that you know, we are we are just the caretakers of public dollars, and and there's an obligation. I feel pretty strongly that uh, we need to be transparent, maybe more transparent than other healthcare systems for that reason. Um, but we do, in the package that we gave you, provided you a breakout of you know the staffing uh, changes and the growth. Uh, I think it's a very interesting story to tell. It's very strategic, right around Dr. Katz's agenda not only to hire more nurses and nurses support, but we also made substantial investments in revenue cycle, which is you know, obviously working, um, and then strategic investments in staff really to generate uh, better care, better access to care and, and future uh, financial benefit. But we're very happy to uh, go through with you, um, you know, any questions, any data that you require, we will work to get that to you. Thank you. And you know, our, our finance division works incredibly hard to put these reports together to prepare us for these hearings. So I appreciate your commitment and outlining any you know, further efforts you're making to address some of these transparency issues and committing to making more information available, particularly around the areas I highlighted in my opening remarks. So thank you um, for your pledge. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted h, &H financial transformation plan? Um, you know, it's not a, not an easy question. I would say, I mean, only in the sense that we don't live in parallel universes. Um, the, the positive is that despite COVID, putting aside our tremendous expenses for COVID, we've continued to increase revenue. And that was the major part of the fiscal transformation plan is decrease administrative expenses, um, provide more nursing and other clinical services and bill insurance successfully. And I'd say that we have done that. Um, the part about the parallel universe is if COVID had not happened, we would have had more opportunity to focus on, you know, what are the services that we can expand? How are the other ways we can, you know, work to increase revenue? And so I'd say we've stayed on the plan. It's just a little, this, this last year has been a little disorienting, right? We, start, we started with one plan and we ended with a different plan in the sense of the, the new plan was survive, oxygenate, keep people alive, um, was our number one focus, you know, throughout. But, but I'd say, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at the figures that uh, John Olberg has provided, we've, we've also hit the revenue targets. Um, and the fact that, that uh, which uh, Councilwoman Rosenthal talked about, obviously the, uh, the change of the FEMA to 100% makes a huge difference, right? If you just take, if you just imagine that we were uh, presenting you the same uh, budget, but we owed $500 million of the COVID response, we would have been in a very different position.
what are the total costs that are being spent on consultants and temp nurses and other temp staff? How does this compare to the previous fiscal years? I'll give a general answer. Uh, definitely, we've spent a huge amount on temp nurses um, because, I mean, we would draw at one, just to give you some sense of the magnitude, at the height, we had uh, nine, in wave one, we had 9,000 people who were not regular employees of, of health and hospitals working for us. Some were from the military, many were registry, they, and they weren't all nurses but we never would have been able to take care of everyone. I mean, we, we were hiring all people who were qualified to help us. Um, and there's no question, especially in the second wave, um, the premium cost on registry has been very high. In wave one, New York City was really heavily impacted, but the rest of the country was not so much. So we were able to draw traveling nurses. In wave two, the rest of the country has been heavily impacted, and so it's very difficult to draw uh, registry nurses. But nonetheless, again, for right or for wrong, my, my orientation has been we have to get the nurses we need, right? That that is the number one priority, and maybe some of them will want to stay with us. So I'm hoping that as the, um, as the second wave subsides, we will use fewer and fewer registry nurses and we are we remain prepared to hire every nurse who wants to work for health and hospitals um we nursing profession has a fair amount of attrition because it's hard work it's physically hard work um it's emotionally hard work so i, I will hire every qualified nurse and those who work for us as registry we know they know us we know them um, they would be a particularly attractive group to us. Did, did the pandemic affect registered nurse retention at h, &H? I know that was certainly an issue even prior to COVID. We had huge losses um, because of illness. Um, I, I, you know, I, again, I don't, that's a great question. I haven't looked to see was our, you know, uh, retirements more this year. It certainly, Chair, wouldn't surprise me. I mean, people, uh, you know, people, and it probably will, if so, intensify in the coming months. People are exhausted. Uh, people are traumatized. Um, and there may be a fair number of people in our system who are working to see this through um, because they are incredibly committed and they realize their colleagues depend on it. And when they see the numbers go down and the census return to normal, they may well say, I did my all, now I'd like a rest. Um, but I'll find out, I don't, I, I'm not aware that the overall attrition was higher this year than past years, but I'll find out. All right, I would, I would really appreciate that because I know it's, it's not just an issue of retirements. I know we have too many young nurses or you know, um, you know, newly trained nurses coming to H&H &H for training and then leaving for higher paying jobs at voluntary systems. And how do we address that long-term attrition issue? And would you say the, the pandemic also affected some of the staffing ratios? I know they're two different questions, but they're somewhat related. Well, the staffing ratio is easy, yes. I mean, be, I mean certainly at the height of it um, because we had people taking care of many more patients we would ideally want. Um, but we also, you know, tried to help them learn how to do that. So for example, many of the rules about charting were minimized um, during the height of the pandemic when we said, what you need to do is to keep everybody oxygenated. You know, that's the number one, you know, goal. I think in terms of fixing the, the nurse attrition issue for the younger nurses, um, the keys to that are retention bonuses. And, you know, I, I think uh, OLR uh, has been much uh, helpful in understanding our concern. And it's a specific to civil service systems. So typically in a civil service system, you raise salaries because you cannot recruit. That's the typical reason 
that civil service systems say you have to increase. I think what people missed around nurses is, well, we could always recruit. We have no trouble recruiting in the sense of brand new nurses. But then when you get brand new nurses, you have to train them for six months. So for six months, you get, um, you have the cost, but you don't yet have the benefit in terms of patient care. And then if they work for you for two years, and then they have the requisite experience to work in a private sector, you've spent a quarter of the salary training them, and now they're maximally valuable. So uh, OLR sees now, I think that we have to figure out, it's not just the question of can we recruit nurses? It's a question of can we keep those nurses who are most valuable to us? And John helped the case by showing how inefficient it was to spend a quarter of the time training nurses only to have them leave. And it was on that basis that OLR granted us promotional increases so that each time nurses stay a few years, they're able to get bonuses. And I think now we have to look and see how well those are working and how, whether or not they need to be adjusted in order to keep nurses. And I know you've been very vocal and um, I think on the record is acknowledging that, you know, we do need better staffing ratios as specifically as it relates to nurses. Um, you know, I just wanted to, to ask, has the pandemic affected, we've heard from, uh, you know, a couple in organizations, has the pandemic affected negotiations with unionized H&H &H staff in any facilities? Like I imagine there have been delays and maybe picking up conversations that were started months ago or even a year ago? Well, I think our big nurse contract was done before COVID, right? And that was, um, as was our, uh, our large contract for our environmental service workers and our other public employees. We did just resolve a few months ago into COVID our doctor's council. So yes, yes, in the sense that uh, it's been very hard for any of us to focus on anything other than, than keeping people oxygenated. Um, and so, you know, unions have the right to certain information, right? They wanna know what's your financial picture. They wanna know what, what is going to be people's roles going forward. And it's been challenging for us to devote enough time to some of those questions. So uh, I think we lucked out that the big contracts were set before COVID hit. Uh, I think a lot of people are wondering what the, the physician healthcare market will be like. You know, we, we don't think of ourselves as a market, but the rest of the market affects us, right? So the parts of the private sector that are focused on revenue generation whether or not the patients will fully come back. And if the patients do not fully come back, what that means for the demand for doctors and nurses. Certainly for the first time I've heard of primary care doctors in New York uh, being let go um, because of lower demand and the fiscal problems in, in private sector. So I think there's a little bit of question mark of you know, what, what the market will do to affect our salaries um, and our retention rates. I would, I, I would say, I think I had a conversation with 1199 specifically on some of their workers. So maybe just follow up with them. But um, from what I understand, T2, I think they employ about 1600 staff. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, how many of the 1,600 T2 staff as of February are contracted? Do you know what the, maybe the demographic breakdown is of that? And, and I'm wondering, um, are there options for some of those individuals to transition to full-time work, considering your plans? Sure. Well, again, I'm always in favor of um, people being employed, not being contractors, right? I'm a public sector person. I always want to make the investment in someone and I want them to make the investment in me. I want them to say, I want a career in health and hospitals. I don't, I don't want people who are, well, this sounds like an interesting job for two months and then I'll do something else because we put a lot of effort into training people. Um, last I looked at, unless John has more 
uh, information, it was about half and half of the total T2 staff. About half were H&H &H employees, about half were contractors. And each month we try to bring on more of the contractors, um, right? So the, the reason for the contractors at all is simply the speed of hiring. Um, and so you hire the people uh, that you can, and then you try to convert the rest. Again, I'd say there's a big question on, you know, what exactly does the future look like for testing in um, New York City, right? At one point, we hit 100,000 tests in one day. Is that what it's going to look like on, you know, July 5th? It's very hard at this moment to, to predict, right? Will we want pop-up testing all over? Will all of the efforts be vaccination? Will we be preparing for another wave of vaccination next fall? I could see that. I could see how, you know, my summer work is preparing for a booster shot and how, how are we going to get a booster shot to 8 million New Yorkers. Um, so many questions at this point. Agreed, and, and I'm just going to pivot back to mental health for my last my last three questions, um, because I, I do know with with all of all of the talk of staff and, and the doctors and the nurses and what they've been through and all all New Yorkers, uh, just a quick focus on mental health and, and just quickly to CHS. How is CHS providing mental health care on Rikers during the pandemic, given that you are, sadly, one of the largest providers of mental health treatment in the city? And then what other health care issues is CHS tackling most often in its care for incarcerated individuals? Is it, is it mental health or is it primary care? We're going to turn to Dr. Yang, but I'll just say I've met her psychiatrist. And I can't imagine a more dedicated, committed group of people to the mentally ill than the psychiatrists who work for correctional health services. Uh, but uh, Patsy, can you give a more general explanation? Sure. Um, th thanks. Uh, the mental mental health has emerged, as in the rest of the community, as as a as a more prominent issue. Um, certainly in the jails, I think in the first wave. Um, or last year, the concerns were like like everywhere else um, about COVID, about what it is, whether whether I have it, how do I do I have it, um, what will it mean to me, um, how do I how do I find out? It was more anxiety about the the disease itself. Um, we continue to be present. Um, we maintained all our services uh, during during that period of time. Um, certainly in our PACE and CAPS units, um, our therapeutic units, our, our staff remained embedded there. Um, we also established a mental health line for people who could call in and speak to us directly um, and specifically about any, any mental health concerns that they have. Um, the, concern, the concerns this time around, you know, a year something later, um, is less about um, the disease itself, then I think the the fatigue that we all feel um, that that um, the isolation and um, the the impact of being incarcerated for a longer period of time for a period of time where courts adjourned last spring um, and depending on which court we're talking about has come back or or in some varying degree um, cases of people who were. Uh, in the community were adjourned um, last spring for people who are in detention. They were also adjourned um, and continue to be. So, so you have the um, double impact of, of COVID concerns plus, you know, not having in-person visitation um, and having uncertainty about when your case will actually be um, handled and, and a decision made. Um, we, uh, so we continue to, to offer both telehealth and telephonic, as well as in-person uh, services, uh, and and mental health remains a, a very a very big one. Um. Thank you. No, I I, I imagine um, it's been incredibly challenging. So please let us know how we can help advocate for those services. And, and for you, Dr. Kess, you know I have Roberto Clemente Gotham Health Center in my district. 
And I know we touched on the shortage of psychiatrists just generally and, and what an obstacle that creates for our communities who desperately need access. Has H&H &H seen Thrive provide fewer mental health service core members? And if so, how is this affecting staffing levels at H and H facilities providing mental health services? Uh, so uh, the uh, we actually, when uh, Thrive um, did their reorganization, we got more people who were able to help with health and hospitals because there was a shift in how they were using uh, their resources, and so. I think the recognition was that health and hospitals was a great site to both train people and, and to engage them. So um, I think where uh, there remains the problem is specifically around psychiatrists. And, how, and what has to change is that, you know, just as we've changed it in primary care, the model needs to go to more of a team model as opposed to a psychiatrist led model. Um, the psychiatrist has a critical role, but it doesn't have to be leading the team. The team can be led by a, a, a licensed psychologist, which is after all a PhD level degree, a licensed social worker, um, and the medication can then be provided either by a psychiatrist or in some cases by family practitioners and uh, internists. Uh, can be pediatricians, can be very good prescribers as long as the diagnosis, what the psychiatrists were also key for is uh, correct diagnosis. So it, once the correct diagnosis has been made, if the person needs um, ongoing treatment, uh, some of the patients could then be cared for from a medical point of view by a generalist as opposed to a psychiatrist. And well, of course, just, just a, a quick shout out to Clemente, which is a wonderful place. Yes, they are. And so they, they've, they told us they haven't been able to hire new mental health clinic staff through Thrive or through H&H &H to replace staff that have left. So I'll just ask that H&H um, &H revisit that hiring issue. And then my last two comments, so we can wrap up, uh, is, you know, at Jacoby Hospital, I went to go visit along with a council member, Riley, a very important and successful cure violence program called Stand Up to Violence, which is a critical violence prevention effort that engages victims of violence in the trauma ward and conducts outreach to at-risk young adults, especially in communities with high rates of gun violence. And so one thing that they told me was that, you know, families come in, with children as young as seven and eight, um, with uh, suicidal ideation, with um, just needs that they cannot provide without having a full-time psychologist on staff. And so I, I, they lack the funding to hire one. Um, so I'm hoping that you will uh, consider advocating for that position to be filled at Jacoby Hospital enabling for that program to expand in what we think is an absolutely critical way. I'll look at that right away. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. And then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, uh, under your leadership of which I as an ally, you know, to the LGBTQ community, we are very thankful. We've seen a vast improvement in, in trans and gender non-conforming healthcare, including a $390,000 program for trans transgender healthcare trainings and community outreach workers, which was actually baselined in fiscal year 2020. And, and again, thank you. This funding is, and of course, thank you to the advocates who made it happen. This funding is included in the city's general operating fund. So it's, it's hard to know how many of the community outreach workers have been hired and retained and how many trainings are being conducted. So we would love to have those numbers on the program so we can advocate successfully. And of course, just, just uh, many, many thanks um, for, for your leadership on that and for everything else. And I guess with that, you know, go ahead, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Um, with that, I think I'm just gonna wrap up. I wanna thank you for, for your time, for your testimony, for 
answering our questions, all of my colleagues, of course, the staff um, at the council who made this hearing happen. We're looking forward to some of the follow up, some of the numbers, some of the data, the information, and of course, that pledge for greater transparency from H and H, and always looking forward to our partnership. Thank, thanks to all of you. Thank you, Chair, um, and I'd like to thank this uh, panel for their testimony, and we'll be moving on to uh, public testimony at this time. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify, and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands. I'd like to now welcome our first public panel. In order, I will be calling on Carmen Charles, followed by Anne Bove, followed by Ralph, Paladino, followed by Natasha Anu Anand Anandajara, followed by Stephen Siodi Miller. Um, Carmen Charles, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello? Hello? Hi, we can hear you. You may begin. Can, can you hear me? We can, we can. Yeah. Okay, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Councilwoman Rivera and all the members of the committee. Uh, my name is Carmen Charles. I am the president of Local 420. I represent public health care workers in uh, health and hospital. Before I begin my testimony, I would like to join the committee in expressing my obedience to the horrendous act of violence against our Asian brothers and sisters in Atlanta and around the country. Hate has no place in our society and I stand with the AAPI community in calling on Atlanta to treat these killings as a hate crime. Local 420 represents 8,700 hospital workers across New York City public health system, along with technicians and aid employed by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner and the department, um, fire department and the correction, department of correction. It has been more than a year since COVID-19 has ravaged New York and the entire country. COVID-19 vaccines are starting to end the pandemic and hopefully by the summer, we will enter some sense of normalcy. The heroes of Local 420 have fought the scourge of COVID-19 with everything we have to protect our communities. Unfortunately, we have lost over two dozen members to this dreadful virus, one of them very recently. Despite the heroism and selfishness of my members, I am here to ardently plead with this committee to prevent the cuts to H plus H. Governor Cuomo's executive budget, budget proposal included cuts to H plus H at 139 million in fiscal year 2021 and 334 million in fiscal year 22. These cuts will be devastating to the system's ability to provide health care to the people most vulnerable among us. H plus H was the tip of the spear against the very worst of COVID-19. The battle that local 420 members and other healthcare workers wage against the pandemic at Elmers, Bellevue, and Coney Island and throughout the rest of the city became a national model for resiliency and grit. We help teach the rest of the world how to deal with this disease. And now we are faced with crippling cuts to H plus H, which will impact our ability to care for the 140,000 patients we serve each year. Um, so much for gratitude for all of our sacrifices. We understand that the state's finances and that the, that of the city are in dire straits because of the pandemic. However, it, Time would expired. Tragic, it would be tragic to balance the budget on the backs of the workers. 
I thank you for giving me the opportunity um, to testify before this committee. Let us also address the disastrous efforts of outsourcing and subcontracting of H plus H services and work towards providing the city with better value by utilizing municipal workforce. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Anne Bo to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Anne Bove and I'm a re uh, retired registered nurse from Bellevue Hospital after 40 years of service. I'm currently faculty at CUNY BMCC in the nursing department. And I sit on the board of directors for Eisner as well as the board of directors for CPHS. And I'd like to make the following recommendations in terms of the city council budget for healthcare. Um, we hope that the city council will guarantee full financial to support to New York City Health and Hospitals, that there'll be no cuts and full funding to maintain services and to expand staffing. And I can speak to witnessing and being participant in terms of establishing staffing for nursing ratios, which we actually had in the late 80s. But then we had a, a mayor, Giuliani, who did a lot of damage to H&H &H that we're still recovering from. Hopefully we want to expand New York City Health and Hospitals footprint to address ongoing COVID um, crisis that we're in, build and expand the public health infrastructure and guarantee full operating needs for New York City Health and Hospitals, which is the backbone of the entire healthcare infrastructure in New York City. Without health and hospitals, there will be no healthcare in New York City. And Health and hospitals provides a disproportionate share of care for Medicaid, uninsured, undocumented, services in poor communities and serves a different, a disproportionate number of New Yorkers of color. We need to reject the state executive budget to cut Medicaid, um, the idea of public hospitals in terms of ICP um, and uh, the DISH funding, as well as hospital reimbursement rates to a local public uh, health funding in terms of looking at article six. We also need to consider, given the infusion of funding from the federal government to the city, 5.6 billion, and to the state, 12.7 billion, all proposed cuts to New York City Health and Hospitals, Medicaid and hospital um, reimbursement rates, et cetera, must be rejected. The one house budget of the assembly and the Senate, it appears that there will be an additional revenues given to, um, uh, it, without in terms of raising additional $7.7 .7 billion. And these additional revenues should be sent obviously to the sources that need them. Explore, we need to also explore ways for the city to address unfair distribution of the DISH and ICP money and general hospital funding that penalizes H&H &H and private safety net hospital and gives too much money to well off large private hospital networks that do not do their fair share. And if you look historically, you can look back to when civil rights um, act was passed and the appropriate distribution of funds was being looked at back in the, six, the late 60s, Time those expired. same hospitals, that these same hospitals are also the ones that are culprits of this. And like I mentioned to you, I could very much speak to staffing because we had a scientific method in terms of nursing to establish what the nurse patient ratios were needed. And I have given that to the city council as well as to the state. And we'll give it again in terms of documentation to show how we met the needs of the patient for that one brief shining moment in terms of patient care delivery. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Ralph Palladino to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Good I'm afternoon. Ralph, now. Good afternoon. Ralph Palladino representing Clerical Administrative Local 1549 and the Metro Plus HMO employees. Uh, I want to thank the City Councilwoman, uh, the Chair, and also the City Council for the questions and their support always. Uh, and also Dr. Katz and his administration for actually remaining on for this public testimony because it's, I've testified five times this, this uh, past month, and this is the only administration that has stayed on for the public. Um, I just want to say, open up by t talking about needs. And uh, 
the city must continue to commit supporting New York City health and hospitals. 1549 has argued for this for 25 years. I have to give credit to the administration for doing so. And this administration, the first one that's done that. Uh, we, we also uh, want the city council to be proactive this week about fighting the Medicaid rate cuts the shifting of the ICP funding from the state to the city. And also we must end the global cap, which is nothing but uh, an excuse to cut services. Um, the Gottfried Rivera legislation in the state should be supported. Uh, and also the invest in New York program for fair taxation must be supported this week. Um, we are asking for the utilization of the civil service interpreter title to be used throughout the city, including New York City Health and Hospitals. We have patient representatives doing some of that interpreter work. Uh, it needs to be expanded. Interpretation of language has always been at the forefront of 1549's fight for the last 20 years. Uh, we need to expand the, that title uh, and utilize the client navigator title for that as well, because they can do that. We're asking for first responder and essential workers bonus pay, funding that the city will receive through the stimulus package. The city will get it. They don't have to spend it that way, but they should use it for what it's used for. And we also have our frontline clerical administrative staff in the COVID clinics, ERs, clinics, ambulatory care, intensive care units, and elsewhere that face-to-face -face, face, uh, work with COVID patients. Um, Overall, I don't have anything negative to say about uh, what's going on at, at New York City Health and Hospitals. I have rooms for improvement in my written testimony. I will not um, go into it. There is a severe shortage of clerical staff. However, there's an overuse of, uh, of temps, no doubt. Uh, and I know we've been working with the unit administration to, to reduce that. But quality of work and HIPAA and other things are all at stake here. And also quality job that should not be a low page work uh, make work uh, organization using low wage workers to do the work that other boys getting paid better to do. Uh, it's not right. And the Dr. Katz, I think, knows this. On the positive side, the clinic appointment system ha has improved, among other things. Uh, so I just want to say, and finally, Time expired. I've addendum the telemedicine issue. I feel telemedicine should not be overused and not replace face to face, person to person. Uh, contact with, with, with the medical people. I documented also my chart. I have some issues with that, but I think it's great to use. I just want to say, finally, it's a pleasure to precede uh, my two friends, Carmen Charles and Anne Beauvais. And I have to say that I've personally experienced in my time at Bellevue, not recently, but in the past, what happens to when you have shortage of nurses. Weights and also um, extra shots of epinephrine in an emergency room for me because there was a shortage of nurses. It is important. Staffing all across is important. We need to improve and increase public health in the city. Let's stop fighting cuts. Let's start expanding. That's what we have to do now. We have an opportunity. Let's do it. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Natasha Anu Anandaraja to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi. I'd like to thank uh, the Committee for Hospitals, Chair Vera, thank you very much um, for everyone here and your teams. Thank you for your incredibly hard work over the past year. It's inspiring to hear about everything that is being done and all the incredible and hard work that has been done. And I'm here to talk about the nitty gritty of protecting our workers. I'm a pediatrician, a public health doctor. I'm currently working as a vaccinator in East New York. I'm here as co-founder and director of COVID Courage, a not-for-profit organization. We've been working for several months with the New York State Nurse Association and the Office of the Public Advocate to facilitate adoption of reusable elastomeric masks across New York City. We understand that attention has recently been consumed, rightly so, by vaccination and staffing issues, but we urge the Committee for Hospitals not to overlook the ongoing need to adequately address PPE issues especially as our city faces an influx of new COVID variants, some of which threaten our vaccination strategy. I would also say from my own experience and those of my healthcare colleagues that a significant proportion of the anxiety and burnout and turnover that you are seeing is perpetuated and heightened by the lack of safety we feel in the workplace. And so adequate PPE is a mental health issue for us and it is also a staff turnover and maintenance and retention issue. 
Elastic elastomeric respirators are securely fitting advanced air filtering respirators, many of which are approved by NIOSH, recommended by CDC, authorized by the FDA for use against COVID. They are reusable, durable, cleanable masks made of silicone or plastic, which take replaceable filters of N95 level or even higher. Unlike traditional disposable N95s, they can be used day after day indefinitely. One elastomeric respirator provides the same level of protection as an N95, but can do the work of thousands of disposable N95s. This is an example of an elastomeric. Another example, this is your traditional disposable N95. We are advocating for the widespread adoption of these reusable elastomeric respirator masks for New York City healthcare workers. Several health systems across the country have already successfully implemented elastomerics. In, in, in New York City, NYU Langone, the Bronx VA, the Brooklyn Hospital Center, and Centralite Health are a few of the programs that have successfully implemented elastomerics. Current prices for NIOSH certified disposable N95 range from $2.50 to $5 per mask, depending on order size. For many healthcare facilities, these prices are prohibitory and they result in an ongoing rationing of N95s. In addition, facilities still struggle to obtain timely deliveries of the specific models and sizes that they need. An MSA basic mask like this one can be obtained for approximately $20. More advanced models with source control and communication enhancements are available for approximately $40. You can see that the break even of providing a healthcare worker with an elastomeric mask happens within a week or even less. Time than expired. Importantly, the addition of elastomeric reusable respirators to hospitals PPE strategy also frees up available N95s for redistribution. We respectfully ask the Committee for Hospitals to commit to the sustainable, equitable protection of New York City healthcare workforce by supporting the integration of elastomerics by making elastomerics available for all frontline health workers at h and care facilities, supporting and promoting other New York City hospitals to transition to elastomerics, including elastomerics in city level procurement and stockpiling plans. Thank you for your consideration of this important step. Thank you for your testimony. Next, uh, we will hear from Stephen Ciotti Miller. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Rivera and Council Members for Hospitals. Um, I'm mainly here to testify and uh, echo uh, the work that uh, Dr. Ananda Raja has already presented. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, at our hospital, at Brooklyn Hospital, uh, we've implemented an elastomeric program, uh, most of which was funded through uh, money that we could drum up through support of organizations like COVID Courage, also some of it from our diminishing bu budget at our own hospital. Um, it's uh, alarming to hear about cuts to the proposed budgets for hospitals in the city um, in the coming fiscal years, because as healthcare grows more and more expensive, there needs to be more uh, money spent in healthcare and not less. Um, but elastomeric programs are obviously a way for the city to save money um, on the budget that they do have. Uh, it just makes a lot more sense to invest that money on something that's reusable. It's not going to wind up in a landfill um, and offer superior protection to the staff uh, without the added stress of having to find PPE when it's required. Um, if this pandemic has proven anything to us, it's that things like this are going to happen in the future um, by pretty much a guarantee. Um, this is going to be a greater occurrence and not a lesser one. And so the city should really plan for this by investing in a, a stockpile of elastomerics and also to help hospitals to budget for these things and encourage them to utilize elastomerics for respiratory protection. Obviously, previously, uh, respirators like N95s weren't necessary in as large numbers because we mainly use them for TB patients. And although we still treat TB patients every day, we don't treat them with near the frequency that we're treating. COVID-19 patients, uh, we're treating uh, 20, 30 patients a day, uh, multiple staff members, multiple visits each day, it just adds up to a huge number of, uh, of disposable N95s being required. Um, whereas in the past uh, year, I haven't used a single uh, disposable N95 in my patient encounters, many thousands of hours in many patient encounters uh, that I've done intubations and managing vented uh, COVID patients in our ICU. So I want to try and encourage the council to really take this issue seriously. I did testify back in May on the same issue, and um, I think it's something that needs to be looked at very seriously. It's, uh, it's definitely the answer 
um, moving away from uh, disposable N95s to something that's more sustainable um, is, is an obvious choice. Um, and thank you for your time. And I can answer any questions if you have any. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to ask Chair Rivera if she has any questions for this panel. I just want to thank you all for your advocacy. I've learned a tremendous amount from, from the people on this panel. And um, uh, I think there's been a valid call here for thinking about how we can create a more sustainable way to protect um, our workforce and our staff. So I want to thank all of the advocates and, and our allies in labor on this call. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just going to quickly ask if any other council members have questions at this time. Seeing no hands, I'm going to thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. In order, I will be calling on Mohammed Shah Jahan, followed by Hallie Yi, followed by Miriam Mohammed Miller, followed by Robin Vitali, followed by Kevin Collins. Mohammed Shah Jahan, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I am uh, head of respiratory care service at the Brooklyn Hospital Center. Thanks, Dr. Anandaraja and Dr. Miller. I am going to testify the use of this elastomeric reusable respirator. And we have been using this here. And we are very grateful to COVID Courage. They were able to give us uh, quite a few masks. Um, we have uh, tested successfully, I would say, a few hundred of our nursing staff and the respiratory therapists, as well as our uh, residents. And as a result of this, we are using less of the N95. And this elastomeric mask, obviously, they need to be fit tested. And it really does provide better protection than the N95. The N95, as you know, it provides a protection only 95%. However, the elastomeric mask fitted with the P100 style of the filters that actually gives you 100% filtration capacity as a result. It is truly better for the healthcare providers. I sincerely hope that the city council and the New York City hospital as a whole they will start to embark on this particular process so that we don't have to depend on N95. The problem with the N95 is every time we keep changing the, the style of the mask, we need it to fit test every staff member. It is also very prohibitive. Fit testing is not simple and easy. You need to go through the various processes. So I sincerely hope that this is the right way to go for the future. Now, we never know what may in store for us for the future. I sincerely think that the city council, the New York City as a whole, will march toward this idea of reusable respirators. If any questions anyone have, please feel free. I thank you for all the good work the city council is doing. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next, uh, we'll hear from Hallie Yi. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Holly Yi. I'm the health policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Um, we are the nation's only Pan-Asian Children and Families Advocacy Organization leading the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support marginalized Asian Pacific or APA children and families. The APA population comprises over 15% of the city, yet the needs of our community are often overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. We're constantly fighting the harmful impacts of the model minority myth and the perpetual foreigner, stereotypes that prevent our needs from being acknowledged, understood, and addressed. This means our communities, as well as the organizations that serve them, often lack resources to provide critical services for those in need. We work with over 40 member and partner organizations to identify and speak out on common challenges and needs across our community. We are also one of four leads for Access Health NYC, an initiative that funds community-based organizations and federally qualified health centers to provide education outreach and assistance to all New Yorkers about how to access healthcare and coverage. Um, right now, as the city continues to face the COVID pandemic, we are unfortunately witnessing the shortcomings in our healthcare and other safety net systems. Already marginalized communities are disproportionately hard hit by the impacts. On top of facing job loss and poverty, many families remain underinsured or uninsured, undocumented, and ineligible for unemployment or the federal stimulus for individuals. 
Additionally, the state seems on the verge of cutting Medicaid once again and Article 6 matching funds for critical public health programs in New York City. We know that in a lot of Asian subgroups, more than half the populations have limited English proficiency, which is preventing them from having access to timely COVID information and care. Our communities have many individuals who are afraid to seek testing and care due to those language or cultural barriers. Those language problems aren't new. Unfortunately, they're just one more like health disparities that have been ignored for far too long and are now compounded in the midst of a pandemic. This egregious gap in language access has led to our communities to rely once again upon CBOs who serve them in the absence of the city resources. Our fear and anger as an Asian American community is real. Our collective trauma has built up for more than a year as our community has been used as a scapegoat for the global pandemic and the fallout from an ill-prepared government. What we're seeing today is rooted in a history of racism in this country and the real threat of white supremacy and white nationalism. The pandemic has def devastatingly impacted APA New Yorkers by exacerbating systemic inequities. And we are seeing so little funding given to our communities that need it, especially now. Um, I wanna touch on the Article 6 cuts, especially. Uh, last year, the city was able to fill in the losses from Article 6 cuts at the state level, yet the governor's executive budget for this year cuts them even further to 10%. While we're pleased that our advocacy efforts have led to the rejection of that in, our, in the one house bills, um, we are still advocating for full restoration to 36% for New York City and request that the city again provide any and all backfill necessary to make public health programs like Access Health whole. New Yorkers need to be able to continue to receive the health services information time expired in a linguistically and culturally responsive way during this difficult time. Thank you for your dedication and service to New York City, especially at this challenging time. We hope you're staying as well and safe as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Maria Mohammed Miller. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, so can you all hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Council Member Rivera, Chair of Hospitals Committee, uh, the entire council. Um, definitely want to thank um, health, uh, health and Hospitals um, for the continued work throughout the pandemic um, and all the hospital systems here today and all the advocates. Um, again, my name is Miriam Mohammed Miller and I'm the Government Relations Manager at Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. Um, and I am here to uh, testify in support of uh, funding requests we put in um, in the hopes that council will support our continued work um, in communities throughout the city. Uh, Planned Parenthood of Greater New York has proudly provided the full range of sexual and reproductive health care services uh, for over 100 years. Um, and in that time, we have worked tirelessly to ensure all New Yorkers, despite their backgrounds, uh, could access our services in culturally relevant and equitable ways. And we recognize that during this devastating pandemic, that the same communities we serve, the same marginalized communities that Planned Parenthood serves were hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, like many New Yorkers and organizations, we also suffered a uh, financial hardship due to uh, decreased revenue, um, a 15% cut in last year's uh, council discretionary funding budget and a reduction in private donations. Um, but again, we still um, have uh, continued to provide our services and have uh, transitioned our uh, service delivery models uh, to telehealth uh, to continue to provide these services um, despite uh, um, the pandemic and the stay at home orders, um, being able to safely provide those services while people are home and can still connect to their provider, providers, excuse me. Um, and this year we are requesting funding um, from several initiatives, um, enhanced funding from the Reproductive and Sexual Health Initiative within the budget to support our clinical work at our health uh, centers and our, uh, the work of our youth health promoters, which are young, young people who are trained to provide sexual reproductive health care education to their peers to remove the stigma and a barrier to access, again, for young people. Um, we are also requesting funding uh, from the dedicated contraceptive fund to support our work um, in our health centers and our, in our Project Street B Mobile Health Center uh, uh, to provide uh, long acting reversible contraceptive uh, services to individuals who are uninsured, ineligible for public insurance, facing any financial hardship, or do not want to use their insurance for confidentiality reasons. 
Um, we are also asking for uh, support uh, from the Trans Equity Programs Initiative to support our work again in our health centers in supporting the trans and gender. Time expired. Um, and uh, asking uh, for support of the council again to support our Project Street Beat program, uh, which is a uh, street outreach program with our mobile health center that provides sexual reproductive health care services uh, to individuals who are at high risk for contracting um, the HIV. Um, HIV. Um, again, we, um, uh, Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, um, is proud to support um, all New Yorkers, especially during this devastating time, continue to provide our services no matter what, no matter an individual's ability to pay or any barrier um, uh, to um, accessing health and look forward to working with the larger public health system uh, to continue to fight this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Robin Vitali to testify. You may begin when you are ready. I'm starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Rivera and the members of the committee. Uh, my name is Robin Vitali. I serve as the Vice President of Health for the American Heart Association here in New York City. Um, I'm very excited to riff off some themes that were provided earlier this morning um, from the administration and from members of the, uh, the committee as well, specifically around how the AHA has uh, had to focus on access to healthcare during this time. Um, nearly a year ago, the organization went through a significant pivot um, in a number of our strategies here in the city. I'm um, thinking about how a number of our clinical partners um, were struggling um, in the onset of the pandemic. Um, nationally, we went through a significant um, overhaul to divert a number of our resources, um, notably $2.5 million around rapid response research, um, looking at how COVID is uh, interacting and uh, the long-term impacts with patients for cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular diseases. Uh, we launched a new data registry specifically looking at COVID-19 patients. Um, the, uh, the reference from uh, Council Member Levine around emergency care during this pandemic was also a significant concern for us. We launched our Don't Die of Doubt campaign, which helped to encourage New Yorkers to seek emergency care when they're having a heart attack or having a stroke, as even at the height of the pandemic, um, obviously getting that type of care was um, incredibly critical for survival rates. And we continue to be very focused on access to care and treatment for our patients. Um, notably, we will be launching shortly a, a similar program, focusing in on encouraging New Yorkers to re-engage in primary care services, um, as that obviously has been a significant uh, concern and burden um, in the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, we have done everything from you know, adjusting our guidelines around treatment and care, um, thinking about how uh, clinical uh, caretakers are uh, having to get recertified in CPR, making sure that everything we um, have a control over, um, the American Heart Association has been doing its part to support clinical care during this urgent time. Um, one of the things that we did early on in the pandemic was also reach out to our clinical partners that have been engaging on a number of initiatives with us and just asking what they needed. What could we be possibly doing um, to support their work on the front lines? Um, and obviously the, the first response is always, we need more PPE. Um, but then the second response was we need more resources to keep our patients at home, um, to help them engage in things like telehealth. And the number one request was around access to blood pressure cuffs. This is something that at the time we had limited resources to be able to provide. We were able to, to send some cuffs out into the community and to get them into the hands of our, our clinical um, network. And uh, we're very um, excited to do that and uh, continue to look for opportunities to divert resources in that way. Um, but the demand is far greater than anything the Heart Association has I'm expired. Provide. So we encourage the council to consider ways to expand that investment, um, to getting more cuffs out to our clinical partners into our health systems and making sure that we're able to continue expanding telehealth in this aftermath. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Kevin Collins to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Ch uh, Chairperson Rivera and committee members. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Kevin Collins, the Executive Director of Doctors Council SEIU. We are a union for doctors as well as a voice for patients and the communities we serve. 
We're affiliated with SEIU and we represent doctors in different states, including New York and here locally at the city hospital system in H&H. &H. We believe in quality, affordable and safe healthcare as a basic human right and social good for all, no matter who you are or where you're from. At Health and Hospitals, we represent every type of doctor from A, allergists and anesthesiologists down to surgeons and vascular surgeons and everything in between. In representing every type of doctor, we also represent full-time, part-time and per diem doctors. No matter whether a doctor worked every day or as needed, like a per diem, all doctors put their lives and livelihoods in the line during the COVID-19 pandemic and should be treated with dignity and respect. We point out that most healthcare workers who work in H&H &H facilities are directly employed by H&H. &H. In contrast, however, while some of our members are employed by H&H, &H, the substantial majority are employed by a subcontractor or a pay pass-through entity known as an affiliate. Our doctors take care of the same patients as H&H &H employees, serve the same communities, are part of the same patient care teams, work in the same public facilities, and are paid by the same public funds. The only difference being that instead of getting a direct paycheck from H&H, &H, the majority of our doctors receive a paycheck from the affiliate subcontractor who receives the money to pay the doctors from H&H. &H. These subcontractors include NYU, Mount Sinai, Correctional Dental Associates, and a professional corporation known as PAGNI, which is uh, formed and wholly funded by H&H. &H. Our members have put their lives on the line during the COVID-19 pandemic and continue to do so, often leaving their families behind to care for the most vulnerable and sick patients and to manage and respond to the disease. Our doctors often work short staffed and are burnt out from going through the COVID uh, pandemic. When COVID first hit New York City or just over a year ago this month, we formed a 24 seven hotline in all our decades of representing doctors, we've never seen anything like that. We had doctors who told us they said goodbye to their families, not because they might just be staying away from them, but they did not think they'd make it back to go home. We had family members calling us crying because they did not think they'd ever see their, fam uh, their doctors, their, their husbands, their, their fathers again. We had doctors being sprayed from intubation procedures, dealing with uh, finding N95 masks, newborn moms struggling with childcare issues, and on and on and on. Um, we're having a press conference on Thursday, March 25th at 12 noon this week at Elmer's Hospital, along with H&H &H and Dr. Katz to say thank you to the doctors across the system who have worked the last year and given so much. Um, turning to budgetary matters, we refer you to the, our written testimony. We continue to call on the mayor and the city council to recognize the challenges and to fully fund H&H. &H. Uh, we are glad and we worked with our international Time the American expired. Rescue Plan. Um, and we thank uh, Senator Schumer for giving the money coming into the state and the city. We have continued to meet um, over the last number of weeks with many state assembly members and senators on the executive budget cuts. We're pleased with the one house bills, but we call on the state not to cut funding to safety net facilities such as health and hospitals in the middle of a pandemic. Um, with respect to the city budget, as we said, we continue to call on the mayor and the city to fully fund health and hospitals. Uh, we look for funding to address how communities of color that are dis disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 receive the sources they, uh, they need, as well as the vaccination efforts to, to go out to those folks as well. And we must be open to new ideas uh, such as telehealth medicine and, and others to fund those to bring health and hospitals, not just through the pandemic, but beyond the pan pandemic, whatever shape uh, medicine will take going forward from there. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, and we, we hope everyone keeps safe and keep well. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it to Chair Rivera for any questions. Again, I just wanna thank the panel and, and for all of you for your advocacy. I know we've worked on a number of issues together and specifically to, to Kevin Collins and, and everything you've done at Doctors' Council. Uh, I'm just really thankful for your guidance and leadership on this and, and for your how intentional you are in making sure we celebrate, you know, and acknowledge how much we've done together. Thank you, Chair. Um, at this time, we have concluded public testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and is yet to be called, please use a Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. Okay, not seeing any hands. I'm going to turn it back to Chair Rivera for closing remarks. 
Thank you to everyone who testified today for bringing up a number of issues. I know we've been through a lot together and I, I think we all absolutely agree that preserving the budget as, as wholly as possible and expanding on, on the care that we desperately need, especially in our public system is, is critical. And to, and to health and hospitals uh, for, for staying on the call, for listening to the public testimony. I think uh, Mr. Palladino was right in that that doesn't typically happen. So thank you very, very much for being here. Um, to all of the advocates who have made any sort of progress, any sort of accomplishment or celebration achievement possible during this past year, thank you for your tireless work. Um, and with that, I will close the hearing. Thank you to the council staff. Thanks, everyone.